Thank you. I am honored for that slow clap. Very nice of you. Um, how many of you would love to increase the quality of your relationships with your friends, family members, classmates, coworkers, and God? Yeah, that's right. So for those of you that raised your hand that said yes, uh, we're going to spend about the next 20, 25 minutes uh, looking at what the Bible says is the key to having healthy relationships. Um, before I get started, I want to introduce myself. My name is Cooper Payne. Uh, I have been married to my wife, Kelsey, or some of you may know her as Kelsey Beth for 11 years. Uh, we met on a spring break trip, uh, so kind of your version of Hume Lake. Um, we met on a spring break trip with the University of Oklahoma BCM, and that was our version of Christian Challenge uh, when I was a freshman in college and she was a senior in high school. Um, we dated throughout college, almost four years, and we were married less than a month after she graduated. Uh, from there, we moved to Fort Worth, Texas, uh, where I worked in sales and marketing, and we began attending Hope Church. And this is where I first heard about the hard attitudes, which we'll be talking about tonight. Skip ahead uh, to the present, and we are blessed with five children. Yeah, okay, there's one of them. I forgot that there would be pictures behind me. See, my wife is really pretty. <laughs> Uh, we have two girls and three boys, ranging from nine to three years old. Um, professionally, I've worked in business and sales and in people operations. My wife homeschools our children, and she works part-time for our church in the kids' ministry. Uh, and I currently serve in our church, working with first through fifth grade boys. So if I can handle first through fifth grade boys every Sunday, I think I can get through tonight. <laughs> Um, so I'm not a pastor. Um, I don't work in full-time ministry. Um, and the issues that I'm going to be talking about tonight, those are things that I've struggled and battled with. Uh, it is only by God's grace and work in my life that I'm able to be up here to speak with you this evening on this topic of putting the goals and interests of others above your own. My hope is that you will find at least one thing to be an encouragement and helpful for you in your relationships. The key verse we will look at this evening is from a book of the Bible in the New Testament called Philippians. Uh, Philippians was written by the Apostle Paul uh, to the church in Philippi when he was in a Roman prison. And he writes this letter to uh, this letter of the Philippians to encourage them to keep living out their faith in Jesus. Uh, and he also give some helpful and practical ways to live the Christian life in a culture that was hostile to their faith. So Philippians 2, 3 through 4, this is going to be our key verse. We're going to go over it now. We're going to keep coming back to this verse throughout the evening. Um, and it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than ourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. Uh, so another question. By a show of hands, uh, who finds selfishness attractive? All right. Okay. Um, how about arrogance and pride? Guys, I saw no ladies raise their hand. Okay. So arrogance and pride, it's not going to work for you. Uh, yeah, these qualities are not uh, universally admired, um, but the truth is we all struggle with them to some degree. And if they are left unchecked, then they can sabotage our relationships. And this is the sad way to live. So if you have a hand out there, if you're wanting to follow along, that first blank there is sad. Uh, and sad stands for selfish, arrogant, and damaging. Selfish is, I want what I want. And arrogant says, uh, not only do I want what I want, but I think I deserve it. And then finally, damaging, and I will hurt you to get it. It's funny, I was just talking with Josh before we came in here, and we were talking about uh, kids. And uh, I have a toddler example. Um, Having five kids, um, all of my kids have gone through the toddler phase. And um, toddlers are inherently 
selfish. And, and no one had to teach them to be selfish. It is just their nature. And, and usually the thing that gets them really riled up is around wanting a toy. And so they, their selfishness comes out with this toy and they'll say, I want that toy. Um, and then they'll say something like, it's mine. Like, I want it. And then what inevitably happens if they're not given the toy, uh, then they will go take the toy from this other child. They may bite them, they may hit them. They're mean. Toddlers are mean. Um, so you, you can see how, how they follow this. They're, they're, they're sad, and, and no one had to teach them to be. Um, we're going to look at a clip here from a, an animated movie called The Bad Guys. Now, I don't know if any of you have seen The Bad Guys, but remember, five kids. So I've seen a, a lot of animated movies. And uh, uh, this one, uh, this first clip, I think gives a really good picture of this sad way to live. All right, so who was the sad one? Um, steak? Shark? Uh, I actually think both were sad. So Snake, he is selfish. Um, he has no intention of sharing this push pop with Shark. Um, he is pretty arrogant. He's just, he doesn't really care about others and their feelings. And he's damaging. He lies to Shark. He says he's going to give him the push pop, uh, but then he lies and he undermines the relationship by lying. And even the tarantula, her name's Webbs, uh, very clever of them, uh, says, you know he's not going to give it to you. So what she has observed with Snake is that he is selfish and he's not, he's not really that good of a guy. It's not in his nature to share. And then we have Shark. Um, he is also selfish. Now, there are five um, people in this group. Um, there is one push pop, and he really wants that push pop for himself. Uh, he's arrogant. He thinks because he wants it, he should get it. No one else. And then when his wants are denied, he gets aggressive and he lashes out. And we do the same thing. When we don't get what we want, we may not jump on someone and attack them uh, ferociously um, or bite them like a toddler. There's consequences for us if we do those kind of things. Um, but we use our words to damage. Um, we, we, we lash out and maybe we give someone a cold shoulder. We, we find some way to hurt them if someone denies what we want. So in this verse here, this Philippians 2, 3 through 4, it says for us to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. So let's look at those a little bit deeper. Uh, first, selfish ambition uh, can be understood as a motivation to elevate oneself. Um, this means we're concerned with our own interest, what will benefit us, our own welfare, really regardless of others. Let me give you an example to illustrate this point and see if you can relate. I'm walking up to a restaurant and I notice a large group approaching about the same time. So what do I do? Do I keep walking at the same pace? Or because I'm such a nice guy, I'm just gonna slow down so that large group can go in front of me. No, I'm gonna speed up to make sure I get there first. Now, I don't wanna look insane. I'm not gonna run, right? Um, but, the, and, but I do walk a little bit faster. And, and the crazy thing is I do this without even thinking about it. It's like I've been programmed to put myself first. And in this scenario, I am actively putting my needs above the groups by beating them to the door. And we see this type of self-above-others approach everywhere in our culture today. Um, the media tells us to follow your heart, do whatever makes you happy. you got to look out for number one, because if you don't look out for yourself, then who else will? And this really creates this sad culture. Now, the next part of the sad equation is arrogance. And in our verse, it says vain conceit. Now, vain conceit is excessive pride or an elevated and incorrect sense of self. 
Author Andrew Murray in the book, Humility, The Path to Holiness, says that pride or the loss of this humility is the root of every sin and evil. Wow, strong words. And in his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis says that pride is the great sin and the devil's most effective and destructive tool. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't really think about pride this way. You know, if I'm a little prideful, I may think, oh, well, that's something, you know, I, I could be a little less prideful. You know, I, I should work on that. You know, I, I should kind of put others first more than I do. But I don't have this view that it is the root of every sin and evil and that it is the great sin. But that is what these two gentlemen propose. So let's look at what the Bible says about pride. Uh, in James 4, 6, it says that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Um, this should give you a clue of how serious pride really is when it says that God opposes the proud. God, the creator of the universe, opposes me when I take a position of being prideful. That is serious. Pride leads us to believe that we are special or superior because of what we have or do, and that makes us more deserving than others. Uh, so here's just a couple of, of examples of how we can become prideful. Uh, my intellect. Um, you guys are at a university. There's a lot of smart people here. I'm sure there's a lot of smart people in this room. Um, your intelligence, that is great. That is a good thing. It is a gift from God. But when we start to think of ourselves as better than others because of our intelligence, um, that's where we start to kind of get, get off and go wrong. Um, it leads to a lack of teachability. That can be towards friends, towards leaders, and then towards God. Another is even our spiritual gifts. Again, a gift from God. Uh, when I was in college, I served on the setup and teardown teams for our Thursday night worship. So very, very similar to this. And I really enjoyed serving on those teams. And I really enjoyed the people that I had the opportunity to serve with. But I began to be prideful and think that because I served on these teams, that I was just a little bit of a better Christian than those that would just show up hang out afterwards, and then leave. And this pride and arrogance began to corrupt the way I saw other people, and especially student leaders in the BCM who did not serve. I was not only prideful and thought of myself as better, but I again began to resent those who did not serve. And I didn't try to get to know them. And it bothered me when I would hear from uh, like another, like a staff leader commending one of these people that I kind of resented because of this, because I thought I deserved to, do, to be praised, not them. During a meeting with the guy who was discipling me at the time, I began to complain <laughs> about this injustice that I was seeing. And I was trying to make the argument that I was right. And the staff should say something to these lazy bumps, right? And then he did something I wasn't expecting. Because pride just, they, it kind of clouds your judgment. Uh, when, when you let this grow in your heart, um, you don't see reality as it is. It, it really does distort reality for you. So I fully expected him to take my side on this but he didn't. He kindly corrected me. He told me I was wrong and then addressed the sin that was in my heart. Um, he actually, he pointed out that these lazy bums uh, were meeting with new people and investing in relationships. And he actually challenged me to do the same thing, to spend time after worship services um, to go and to talk with people and to make new relationships instead of just going to my serving role. And he was right, of course. You know, when people are kind of outside of the situation, they can kind of see into what's really going on, if you'll let them. And we had a good enough relationship that I was able to be humble enough 
to see it his way. You know, what had once been a joy for me, the devil used pride to steal my joy and damage my relationships. And it wasn't until a friend who cared enough about me, who corrected me, that I was able to see my sin, ask God's forgiveness, and move forward in a God-honoring way. And that leads us to the right way to live. So let's look at this verse again. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also the interest of others. So in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Um, this command by Paul is so counterintuitive and so countercultural. We are me first people living in a me first society. But the Bible tells me to stop focusing on what I want and what I think I deserve and intentionally look for ways to elevate others. And then we all have interest in life. We all have things that we're responsible for. We all have goals we wish to accomplish. And this passage isn't saying that those things are not important. We should handle our responsibilities and we should seek to accomplish our goals. It's not wrong for us to be concerned about what our interests are, but if we make the pursuit of our interests more important than other people, then that's where it goes wrong for us. And the greatest example that we see in history and in the Bible displaying this kind of humility and self-sacrifice is Jesus Christ. The next verses in Philippians 5 through 8 records this about Jesus. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see here, we have this example of Jesus who willingly stepped down from his place in heaven to be born as a baby, to live a normal life as a carpenter's son. And then he dedicated his life and ministry to serving others, even though he was God in human form and, and could have been worshiped. He deserved it. Eventually, uh, he made the ultimate sacrifice for humanity by dying on the cross for our sins uh, so that we can be re forgiven and be in a right relationship with God and others. If you want to have good relationships and if you want to really step out of this cycle of this sad type of relationship, you need Jesus to help you do it. You can't do these things on your own. You might be able to for a little bit, you know, you might be able to put the needs and interests of others above your own for a while. But if you're going to have long term success in this area, then you need God's help. So this leads us to our last point of the evening. See, almost done. We're already to our last point. This is my new way to live. During Jesus' ministry, he was often tested by the religious leaders of the day, hoping that they might be able to trip him up or find something to use against him. So in Matthew 22, 36 through 40, we read this account. A Pharisee asked, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the commandments, oh, sorry, all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And today we, we've kind of boiled this down. You may have heard this, that is love God, love people. In my first year of marriage, not much older than most of you, 
uh, I was having breakfast with a guy that was a couple years older than me, and he shared with me an easy way to put into practice the heart attitude of putting the goals and interests of others before my own. And uh, this is not in your notes, so if you're curious, you can write this down. It's called Mission Others Me. And it only goes in that order. When we get these out of order is when we begin to have issues in our relationships. That same day that I had breakfast with this individual and he taught me this, um, my wife was experiencing stomach pain and we had no idea what it was. She, she was supposed to go to an event that day and she kind of headed out and then a few minutes later she came back in and uh, she went to lay down. And uh, we just thought she wasn't feeling very well. A little bit later, I can hear her, and she's crying uh, back in our um, bedroom. And she is having extreme stomach pain. Well, um, we make the, the call to take her to the emer emergency room because we, we just didn't know what to do. The pain was getting worse and worse. And what ended up happening was uh, her appendix was about to rupture. Um, but we, thankfully, we got her in and got her into surgery before this happened. She had an, an emergency appendectomy uh, that night. So for the next week about, she was unable to do the things that she normally would do on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, where they do the incision. It's right around the place where you sit up. And so God gave me a very... Um, practical time to practice this mission, others, me. Now, the mission of a husband, and I know many of you in here are not married yet, but it is to, uh, it is to love and to sacrifice for your family and for your spouse. That, that is your mission, your calling as a husband. And, and, and as a believer, it is, is to lead your family towards Christ. Um, then to put others first. So my wife is needs to be first in this. And then I have my responsibilities that I need to do. Back in our, our passage here in Matthew, um, our mission in uh, the great commandment is to love God and then live to make him known. So this is the great commandment and then the great commission. And the others is we do this uh, by loving and serving others and telling others about Jesus. And then we take care of our responsibilities. Now, taking care of our responsibilities is important. If we don't take care of our responsibilities, then it kind of serves to undermine these other things. So make sure you do that. It is important. Um, we're going to watch another clip from the bad guys. And uh, what's happened, kind of a little bit of a setup here, is that they've just returned to their lair, and they see that all of their stolen loot is gone, and they are freaking out. So here you go. So when Snake, the saddest of all of the group, chooses to sacrifice so one of his friends can be happy, it changes the entire mood of the group there. So if in your relationships you have historically operated out of this me first um, mentality instead of an other first mentality and you begin to serve others and you begin to give preference to other people uh, let me tell you your relationships with people will radically begin to change for the better um, it's not just that this cartoon says it will the bible says it will and, and that's the authority as we wrap up tonight, I want to give you a few practical examples of how you can begin putting the goals and interests of others above yourself. So uh, maybe you can help a friend study for a test instead of playing video games or watching TV. You know, if you've been at class all day and you've been studying, and the last thing you want to do is more studying. Uh, I get that. You want to you wanna chill. But if you have someone, you know someone that they have a big test coming up that maybe they're stressed out about, instead of looking to relax yourself, you could go and you could help them. Um, help set up or clean up for a challenge event. You know, these things, they, they take work. They take people uh, to make these things happen. So you could give some of your time either before or after um, so these challenge events can happen. 
Um, if you have roommates, who has roommates in here? All right, most of you. Um, without being asked or expecting a thank you, take out the trash, wash the dishes, clean the bathroom, and do this as many times as it is needed. Don't just do it once and like, okay, well, I did my duty. Whose turn is it next? If we were to put the goals and interest of others and consider others better than ourselves, then the answer is we do it every time it needs to be done. Listen before speaking. I'm sure you've had this happen where you're having a conversation with a friend and they wanna tell you something that's really important, something that's going on in their life. And the entire time, you're just thinking about what you're going to say instead of really listening to them. Because um, you might want to you know, show how like, intelligent you are or you know, what, whatever it may be. Take the time to really listen to people. Take the time to ask questions, to show genuine empathy. If you do that in your relationships, the trust will grow and uh, your relationships will be much better with people. When you go home for Thanksgiving next week, for those of you that are, um, help set the table instead of watching the football game. Or if you got skills in the kitchen, then go help out in the kitchen. Uh, I have no skills in the kitchen. I stay out of the kitchen. Uh, so I help clean up or set up. Or my stage of life right now is actually watching kids so other people can do their thing. And then before and after challenge events, look for opportunities to introduce yourself to someone that you don't know. I know this can be hard for some of us, for introverts, stepping out of our comfort zone when there's a group of friends you already know that it'd be so easy to talk to. But in doing this and in introducing yourself to someone you don't know, that may be the most significant reason why they want to come back. It's not because of these guest speakers um, who are showing you know, clips of uh, cartoons uh, that they wanna come back. Uh, it's because that someone took a genuine interest in them and showed kindness to them. So what is one thing that you can do this week to put the goals and interests of others above your own? I want you to think about that. You know, application is really the most important thing. Um, you, you, can, you can hear many, many good sermons from a lot of different people. But if you never seek to apply those things, then your life will never be changed. So just what is one thing? Maybe it's from this list that I just kind of read off. Maybe there was something that resonated with you. Maybe there was something else that as we were going through this message tonight, that something stood out to you, that God put something or someone on your heart. I would encourage you to obey quickly. Don't delay in that. Let me pray for us. Uh, God, thank you that you love us and you give us grace. Um, thank you that um, you have given us kind of a, a map and a guide to show us how to be uh, and how to have good, healthy relationships. And I pray that for each one of these students that they would come out of this tonight and, and they, would, they would think about that one thing that they can do this week and then they would be obedient and they would do that. Uh, God, I pray that they would just have success in their relationships and that they would all have a wonderful Thanksgiving with their family. It's your name I pray, amen.